Hello, and thank you for accessing the recording of the Cleary Center's webinar, Cleary Compliance Challenges Collecting Statistics. This webinar is one of a series of free webinars during National Campus Safety Awareness Month. My name is Abigail Boyer, Associate Executive Director of Programs for the Cleary Center for Security on Campus, and I was the moderator for the Collecting Statistics webinar. Due to some technical difficulties, the first seven minutes of the webinar recording were missing from our overall recording, so I'm going to fill you in on the missing content and then we will launch into the rest of the material. Throughout the webinar, you will hear moments where we asked participants to lend their own thoughts, ideas, and questions to the conversation, and so there will be moments where we pause and ask for their feedback. The webinar was recorded and was shared in the National Campus Safety Awareness Month email. If you've not had the opportunity to sign up to participate in this year's National Campus Safety Awareness Month campaign, you can do so by visiting our website at www.clearycenter.org. As a reminder, this year's No More, Do More campaign connects institutions with information and resources at no cost to them. Individuals that sign up for the campaign have access to numerous resources that are divided into No More resources that increase knowledge in specific areas and Do More resources that turn knowledge into action through policy evaluations, programs, or other action steps. Just to give you a flow of the webinar, we started with a panelist discussion and then left some time at the end of the discussion for questions and answers. There were also some questions that were answered throughout the webinar since participants lended their own voice to the content itself. I'm going to share a little bit about each panelist and then we're going to review some content areas before we go into the recording. Dr. Sherilyn Horsey is the Vice President for Enrollment and Student Services at Gwynedd Mercy University in Gwynedd Valley, Pennsylvania. Prior to joining Gwynedd Mercy, Sherilyn thrived in leadership roles at public and private, secular and non-secular institutions, ranging from an historically black institution, public research institution, women's college, and private co-educational college. Sherilyn is in her 13th year at the university. Dr. Horsey has experience working with and for nonprofit entities, ranging from social service agencies to higher education institutions. Dr. Horsey also serves as an evaluator for the Commission on Higher Education Middle States Association and as secretary for the Board of Trustees for Hope Partnership for Education, an independent middle school and adult education center serving North Philadelphia. Maurizio Delisi has been employed at Drexel University Public Safety for seven years. As the Associate Director of Operations, he is responsible for overseeing all the technical requirements of the agency, including mobile connected devices, radio systems, computer systems, computerized dispatch, report management, mobile report writing, and mapping. Maurizio oversees Cleary and UCR compliance for the university. He's developed in-house policies to ensure compliance with the reporting requirements of both programs, and he coordinates compliance with various departments outside of public safety and prepares the annual security report. This webinar in particular addresses collecting statistics under the Cleary Act, which come from two different areas. Those individuals identified as campus security authorities under the Act and from local law enforcement. Before we start talking to panelists, I want to give you a sense of some of the different uh, things we need to consider when looking at campus security authorities and local law enforcement. Under the Cleary Act, the definition of who is required to report statistics under the law is broader than just individuals within campus police and security, and there are some very good reasons for that. We know that when someone comes forward and shares report of a crime, when somebody shares that they've been victimized, a lot of times they will choose to go to somebody that they trust. They are going because they want to access information, they may want to make a formal report, they may be trying to figure out what to do next. And so a campus security authority under the Cleary Act is certainly campus police or security, but it also includes individuals who have responsibility for campus security, like an RA or an access monitor. It also includes individuals or offices designated to receive crime reports. So if an institutional policy tells someone to report to a specific location, that person or that department is now considered campus security, a campus security authority, or the individuals within that department are campus security authorities. So individuals may broaden the scope of who they consider to be CSAs by designating more individuals or offices as those who should receive crime reports. 
It also includes officials with significant responsibility for student and campus activities. And so that is probably the widest range of individuals that we see within the definition for campus security authorities. That might include a dean of students, it could be student activities staff, it could be resident assistants or coaches. So one of the things to think about is that a campus security authority is really determined by function. If someone has significant responsibility for student or campus activities, they would fit under the definition of campus security authorities. And so they would need to know of their role as a CSA and also have an understanding of what do they need to do or what's expected of them under that role of campus security authority. In addition to that, institutions have to collect statistics from local police. And so colleges and universities must make a good faith effort to obtain the information of crimes that occurred within their Cleary geography uh, that they may not be aware of or that um, certainly were reported to local police. Now, colleges and universities have this requirement. However, local police does not have a requirement under the Clery Act. So what that means is that institutions may have mixed responses in terms of the type of information they're receiving from local, from local police. A really key element in bridging these relationships and getting this information is how are you documenting what you are looking to receive and how are you documenting your response. So reaching out to local police should include providing really specific information as to what crimes need to be reported, um, in what geography, what locations need to be reported, when does the institution need the information, um, what definitions is the campus using because we know that the Cleary definitions can sometimes vary from those local definitions. So when the campus is reaching out to local law enforcement, they should be really clear as to what they need and why they need it. A lot of times we'll have local law enforcement that really didn't have an understanding of why the campus was reaching out for this information and didn't know to prioritize getting those statistics to the campus. So one of the pieces the webinar will address is what are some strategies for reaching out to local law enforcement to collect this type of information. One of the reasons why we included this webinar in our series on common compliance challenges is Department of Education program reviews have highlighted institutions that really have had challenges in reporting accurate statistics because they don't have a clear audit trail. So what we see frequently and the Clery Center often sees this in the work and the training that we do is that a lot of times institutions may be doing outreach for example to local law enforcement but they have no structure for documenting how they made that outreach. Was it by phone? Was it by email? What information did you provide to them so they would know what they're expected to share? And what's your process for documenting all of those different steps? Similarly with campus security authorities, colleges or universities may not have a reporting structure. So a question to ask as we go into this webinar is do we have reporting forms that help clarify the information that a campus security authority should share? Is it a form that's through our website? Is it a form that's a physical document? Are there other companion resources that can help provide CSAs with the information they need to meet this obligation and to know what's expected of them? One resource that you'll hear us referencing throughout the webinar is a set of CSA training slides that the Cleary Center has created for National Campus Safety Awareness Month that you can download for free. And so if you're somebody who is relatively new to Cleary reporting or you're looking for more information on CSAs, that's also a good resource to help educate yourself and others about the role of campus security authorities. It walks through what the requirements are. It looks at the spirit of why are institutions doing this type of reporting and it also provides some clear examples of how you can communicate this in a training format to your campus security authorities. And we will address training CSAs later on in the webinar. Where the recording picks up is a conversation that I'm having with Dr. Cheryl Lynn Horsey. And the question that I ask of her is once we know the definition of a CSA, how do we explore how the institution should identify who these campus security authorities are. So going back to a point I made earlier, we know that CSAs are defined by their function. So does that person have significant responsibility for student and campus activities? Do they fall in one of these categories? And so what that process looks like can vary from campus to campus. So we're going to hear a little bit from Dr. Horsey about what that looked like for her campus. You'll notice that when she's talking, she's going to mention that her campus defines CSAs even more broadly than what we may see on some other institutions, and we'll talk a little bit more about why and why her particular campus made that decision. 
So in the meantime, we appreciate you taking the time to listen to this recording. There's information at the end of the webinar as to how you can reach out to us, if, us uh, to the Clery Center if you have any pending questions, if there's anything that comes up as you access the recording that you would need to know. And so again, thank you for joining us. And now we will pick up on where our recording started. So we went in and um, we, we went through who we identified or who we could identify as the CSAs. And so uh, we have people like the president is a CSA and all vice presidents, all deans of our schools, the Title IX coordinator, all of our student activities and student affairs staff, full-time faculty members, um, all athletic staff. Um, any of our academic resource center uh, or academic advising people, all of our residence life staff, the director of physical plant, the director of uh, housekeeping, and of course all the public safety officers. Those are the people who are formally identified as, as our CSAs. And of course, we, uh, since we identified faculty, that leaves a challenge for us of, of making sure that um, we connect with our adjunct professors um, because they are people who are flying in to teach a course uh, quickly and they also have competing obligations but we have a responsibility to make sure that they have training as well uh, because it, it might be very possible that students will reach out to those individuals as well. Right. So I just want to loop back on a couple of things that you said, um, because I think it also shows some distinctions in how things can change campus to campus. So one thing that I want to mention is I think um, a lot of folks were saying that they were, they're now able to see the slides, so I apologize for any of our technical challenges that we are having today. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to revisit is that definition of who's a campus security authority, because some of what Cheryl just acknowledged or um, talked about really goes back to what I mentioned a little bit earlier, in that some institutions may choose to broaden the scope of who they consider to be a campus security authority, as Cheryl has outlined or mentioned in her particular section. So, for example, one thing that comes up quite a bit is this question of faculty and whether faculty are campus security authorities. And typically, the way that the Department of Education from a Cleary perspective would evaluate a campus security authority is that faculty typically would not be campus security authorities unless they ha have significant responsibility for student and campus activities. So if it's a faculty member that their only role is within the classroom, um, but they aren't playing another role outside of that, normally those individuals would not be faculty under the Cleary Act. However, say that same faculty member also is an advisor to a student group or is a coach or plays another role on the campus that gives him or her significant responsibility for student and, and campus activities, they would now cross over and become campus security authorities. So to go back to some of what Cheryl was highlighting for her particular campus, you might notice, and we see this quite a bit, especially on small, at small institutions, that a campus may analyze and say, you know what, we want to designate a broader range of individuals that we consider to um, be those that will that will designate to receive crime reports. So in her case and for her campus, she's broadened the scope in including faculty as those individuals to whom somebody can make a report. Um, so just to, to respond to that and to highlight the difference, especially because the question of faculty often comes up quite a bit on the campus. Normally faculty would not be considered campus security authorities. However, the institution does have the option to expand who they would include under those requirements um, or who they would designate crime support to if they think it's appropriate for their environment. Um, so what I appreciate, especially about what Cheryl was just sharing, is you'll notice kind of the time and care and looking at, well, what is the structure of our community? What does information sharing already look like um, on our particular campus? And how do we make sure that we are identifying CAs, CSAs as appropriate? So, Mo, I'm going to um, go to you and ask you to share a little bit. I'm going to move our slides forward um, back to our slide about identifying CSAs. Can you share a little bit about what that process looked like on your campus? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're currently uh, changing our approach of how we look at CSAs. Previously, our stance was to include every employee as a CSA. And we've since backed off of that stance and we're actively identifying employees that meet the definition of a campus security authority. We, we want to encourage every employee to report crime, but we also understand that 
not every uh, one fits the definition of a CSA. So at, at this point in the process, we're starting over. Uh, we've reached out to our HR department, and we provide them the definition of a CSA, and they in turn have provided us lists of employees broken down by department, and the employees that they think meet the criteria based on job uh, descriptions that we have on file. Uh, in some cases, identification has been very easy. We can carve out whole departments such as athletics and, and student affairs, and we know right away that every employee in those departments is going to be a CSA. Other identifications are not as simple or straightforward. So uh, to, to go forward with that, our next step is to reach out to individual department heads and request that they review their own employee rosters and tell us who meets the definition of a CSA. Uh, once we identify those employees, our goal is to ask our HR department again to flag the employee file with some type of CSA identifier. Um, so that will make it easier for us in the long run to either create lists of CSA, contact employees, and, and eventually uh, push online training out to um, the CSAs. Um, for this process right now, um, this is really new to us. So HR has been really instrumental uh, in the process. Um, somebody should probably add to your Clery team. Uh, our university is going through some changes in staffing, so it's taken a little bit longer than I had anticipated, but it's something I hope to get done before the end of the year. Right. And I think a lot of what was being shared by um, Mo just a minute ago really parallels with what a lot of institutions are doing. So even though um, for many of you, as when we um, did the question a little bit earlier, you made the notation that um, some of you have identified or you think you've identified CSAs, but you don't necessarily have a formalized process um, for making sure that you're documenting that or doing that kind of outreach. So many institutions that we've worked with have really been at the same place that Mo is describing. So looking at how do we really understand when we look at who has significant responsibility for student and campus activities, how do we make sure that we understand who would fit that description? Um, and also really realistically looking at the fact that you are not going to know um, in detail every single person on your campus. So that's where it's really important and especially as Mo has outlined just a few moments ago, it's really important to consider, well, who on our campus would be able to help support in this? So if we're looking to determine CSAs by function, not just considering their title, but what function do they play on the role so that we can address those nuances for if we have faculty that are also advisors um, or anything or any of those other layers, then what we'll want to consider is how do we make sure that we're communicating with the people that would have um, an understanding of those, um, of, of those details. So Mo mentioned that he got a list of employees and he worked with others that would help to look at, okay, based on the function of what we know of what this person does, not just in their job description, but roles, other roles that they may play on campus, who meets that criteria? And then how are we documenting that and making sure that we have an understanding? Um, so one of the notations that you'll see on the screen, and hopefully the slides are now working for those of you that were having trouble before, um, leadership teams can help define these roles. So it may not necessarily be working individually with every single person um, on your campus to determine that, but really looking at who would kind of be the keepers of this information on the campus, um, leaders within the departments that can help you really identify what that looks like. And I think one of the things that Mo has really nicely highlighted is how HR may play a role in making this determination as well. And so human resources um, especially is an area where we're seeing more and more campuses recognize the overlap of where they might be involved with CLERI requirements, not just in identifying CSAs, but in making sure um, that, that prospective employees are accessing information about your annual security report, or whether it's looking at training and the role that they might play there. So consider whether, as, as, as Mo mentioned, if you have a Cleary team, is this or are these um, roles people who typically are involved in our Cleary team, and if not, um, are they people that should be? 
We also have a couple of different um, other questions coming in that I want to address before we move to the next part of our presentation. So one of the questions is, are faculty only CSAs when wearing the hat as an advisor? So one of the things to think about with Cleary is that you wouldn't be wearing the Cleary hat or not wearing the Cleary Act, so, uh, the Cleary hat. So for example, if um, an institution determines that they are going to list faculty as campus security authorities, that would make them CSAs um, no matter what. Another question that came in is, what about sexual assault victim advocates? Are they considered CSAs under Cleary, even though communications with them are privileged under state law? So an important thing to note in terms of campus security authorities is that pastoral or professional counselors are exempt from Cleary reporting. Um, now, when it comes to victim advocates, some of that can vary from state to state. So for example, some um, states do have uh, confidentiality roles in which those individuals would be privileged, but other states may not. So an advocate on one particular campus may have privilege under the state, whereas another campus um, advocate may not, even though they are functioning in a very similar or same role. So what the institution would need to determine is, one, do those individuals have significant responsibility for student and campus activity? Um, two, are they privileged, in which case, um, you know, if they have confidentiality, they wouldn't be reporting under Cleary. So some of that, so there are a couple of different layers that are going to come into play when considering those advocates. Um, a really nice breakdown, because we know that there's quite an overlap between the Cleary Act and Title IX, a really nice breakdown to help you evaluate that and determine those roles is within the, um, the Not Alone website. So the uh, the White House Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault created a document that talks about the intersections between Title IX, Cleary, and FERPA, and who's required to report what under each role. Um, so we can make sure that, that um, we're able to plug in that information and send follow-up communication about that, because that will help you better identify those on your particular campus. We have a couple of different other questions coming in, but some of them relate to topics that we're going to cover in the remainder of the webinar. So I'm going to move on to our next topic, but I really appreciate what I'm seeing, and we're certainly going to address as many of these questions as possible as we go along. So the next piece is, what strategies do you use to notify and train campus security authorities? So I'd like to ask all of you first and get a sense, and I'll read some of the answers. Um, so I'd like to get a sense of what are some of the strategies that you use with campus security authorities in order to um, make sure that they're aware of their obligations. So once you've gone past that identification stage, how do you make sure that they're trained on what they're expected to do? So some people are saying we don't really have formalized training. It's something that we're exploring doing. Um, we have others saying that they offer multiple different training options for scheduling issues. So recognizing that campus security authorities may not always be available all at the same time. So there may be multiple strategies uh, and multiple times in which type, this type of training is offered. Um, an email and provide a link for training. We use outside vendors. We use a video. I know a couple of you are saying that um, you use the Cleary Center's Campus Security Authority training video. So there are a number of different methods that might be used in order to train. Um, some of the resources that I want to make sure to point you to before we talk a little bit more in depth about strategies that our panelists have used is one of the links that we'll plug into your control panel are sample training slides. Um, so if you're an institution, if you're one of the folks that are sharing with us and saying that this is something that's new for your campus, you're really trying to explore what that's going to look like. As part of National Campus Safety Awareness Month, we've drafted just some sample slides to give you uh, an idea of where you might start in terms of some of that in-person training. One of the handouts that's also included that hopefully you had the chance to download is a handout from the Handbook for Campus Safety and Security Reporting that walks through some different things to consider or think about in terms of providing training to campus security authorities. Um, so what I'd like to do is learn a little bit more from Cheryl and Mo what that looks like on their particular campuses in terms of training. So Mo, let's start with you for this one. Can you tell me a little bit more about your process for training CSAs and the strategies that you've used? Sure. Um, we, we already have uh, Title IX, mandatory Title IX and mandatory protection of minor training on our campus, and we're currently working to create a CSA training that 
make sets and also coexists with, with the training that we currently offer. Uh, we have a, a team that's comprised of our Title IX uh, and Protection of Minors folks as well as the Cleary teams. And we've been working together for some time with our learning and development specialists in our HR department uh, to develop online training for our employees. Uh, initially, our goal was to provide like a single training for all the topics, but we scrapped this idea in favor of, of three separate targeted training. But across all of our themes, we, we, we have a motto that we use, and it's see something, hear something, know something, and say something. And what we want employees to know that if you're not in a position to handle the situation, uh, make sure you say something to those who can. Um, and we want to be able to provide training and resources that is meaningful and delivers the message without being overly redundant. So there's a lot of crossover between the three trainings, and we're trying not to uh, duplicate it when we present it. Um, we, our training is mostly complete for, for Cleary CSA, and we have training packets and, and handout materials finished. And our goal really is just to identify the CSAs so we can present the information to them. Um, and, and one of the things we want to be able to do for CSAs is to provide the specifics uh, to be able to perform their roles, but we also at the same time want to encourage everyone on campus to report crime. So I think it's equally important to explain to employees that even though uh, you're not technically designated a CSA, you should still share information about crime uh, with public safety or whoever the reporting party that may be. Um, we, and we, we're trying to deliver this message because Many employees already have an obligation to report certain types of offenses other, under either Title IX or under laws requiring um, mandatory reporting for protection of minors. Um, the Title IX office has made it really easy for us uh, because they already receive information specific to offenses uh, to Title IX. So a lot of that uh, information is uh, passed over to us once they receive it. Um, it I, I, it's a lot of work to present three trainings to, for, for all these uh, different topics, but um, we want to ensure that CSAs understand the specificity of their role as a CSA and as well as that of a responsible employee. Uh, it, it's going to take some time to develop your own training, I think, that's going to be specific to your university. Our approach was to reach out to the Cleary Center. Uh, we leveraged our membership as a collaborative member to borrow uh, training materials to incorporate in our training. And we also reached out to other universities and asked them if they would share their presentations. Um, and we worked with our HR department. They have training specialists, so we kind of provided the basic slides for, for them, and they dressed them up and added all the uh, uh, multimedia materials that would make it uh, more presentable in an online environment. Um, so that's what I have right now for that. Sure. Thank you, Mao. And I feel like you were saying so many good things that even in taking notes, I, you know, I couldn't capture all of them. But one of the things that was coming up quite a bit in what he was sharing was also this overlap and this intersection with Title IX. Um, so today we're focusing specifically on campus security authorities and reporting under Cleary. Yeah. But we know that there's also a segment of individuals that are required to report under Title IX called responsible employees. And so one of the things that I appreciate about what Mo was sharing was the fact that they really looked at some of these intersections ahead of time. And they also thought carefully about what some of the questions are that may come up or, or where that overlap may be. So that's something to think about in terms of not only training for campus security authorities, but also for responsible employees under Title IX and where there may be an overlap. Um, one of the practices that I've seen that I think is really useful is having representatives um, that work closely with both of the laws as you're conducting training, making sure that they are attending because inevitably questions will come up about that overlap. Um, and even though the focus of this webinar is not on that, we have another webinar that's coming up, again, that's free next Thursday that's going to look at responsible employees and campus security authorities specifically and where we see some of that overlap and intersection and how to navigate that. Um, so that webinar is, is available on our website. You can certainly sign up for that and access that for free. Um, but one of the other things that I also appreciated that you considered was looking at what's already out there that's available. Um, you know, you talk 
talked about a number of different people on your campus that have helped supported the work that you do. But I know a lot of times in our trainings, we also get a, a you know folks that will attend and will say, well, I'm feeling very alone in all of this. They may feel as though they're the lone soldier in terms of identifying CSAs or in providing this type of training. So that's where it's useful to see what existing tools and resources might be available. So looking at those that we've provided to you, like those training slides, um, looking at other resources um, that might support what you're doing. And one of the things that I, I always love, especially in working with all of the different people that interact with the Cleary Center, is we see a lot of people who are sharing good ideas with others. Um, so if there's something that another institution has done in terms of training that's really interesting or exciting, it's certainly okay to learn from that and to utilize that um, as well. Uh, the final piece that I wanted to touch on before we move on to Cheryl is also this idea that Mo brought up of even though we're training campus security authorities, we're also taking some time to talk to our general community as to the fact that we want them to come forward. We're encouraging reporting regardless of who the person is. And I think that that is absolutely critical because a lot of times that will be a question that you may even get in campus security authority training. Well, why would this group of people be required to report and others are not? And so what we always go back to when, when we get that type of question is we're talking about who's required to report under the law, but we're certainly not limiting who can report under the law. So think about outside of just training, what are some of the other different ways that you communicate about reporting and where people can go to get that type of support on the campus, regardless of whether or not a person is a campus security authority. So Cheryl, I'd like to move to you, and if you can share a little bit, your, the structure of your campus is different than, than Drexel's, if you can share a little bit about what training looks like on your particular campus. Sure, well, training for us is really facilitated up from my division. Um, we have an HR department, um, but our HR department consists of two people, and so obviously with all their other responsibilities, this needs to be a shared function. Um, so within my division, I host annual trainings. Uh, what I do is host trainings for the resident assistants um, through the Housing and Residence Life, and also training uh, via faculty orientation, faculty uh, meetings, and for uh, enrollment and student development meetings. And I expand the enrollment and student development meetings to include those personnel who are in the academic support services areas, such as advising or the academic resource center or tutoring. Um, and what we do is we use a host of tools. We, we utilize the video um, from the Clary Center. We also have had a guest speakers. We've had actually the Clary Center come and provided training for us. Uh, we're at a great point right now in that we're totally revising the web site and we're now going to have a specific area that's dedicated where we can put videos up and so as people come into the community they're able to go to this area and and see uh, some of the videos and information that we have. We too prevail upon our colleagues around um, the nation really and when we see things um, at conferences that are that are very interesting and the format is something that we might be able to adapt, we also utilize those opportunities. Um, you know, being a small campus, we, we, have, we have a challenge. Uh, we want to make sure that the training is ongoing. Uh, we know that it can't be one and done, but how can we get the information to the faculty or staff who are onboarding, you know, like every other month? And, and the way that we've determined we're going to do that is dedicate space on the new web page so that we can, we can make that happen. Um, so that's how we're training right now. Right. And so just as a reminder, I know, again, she's speaking to her campus, so some of those questions around faculty will come up um, and may not be specific to your own campus for those of you who are attending the webinar. But one of the themes I think that was so clear in, in what she was sharing is really thinking about those many audiences. Um, so one of the respondents that, that answered one of our questions in the control panel talked about how they had different trainings at different times for different audiences. So recognizing where there may be some of those gaps in terms of people's schedules and being able to provide this type of training and thinking carefully about that. 
Um, to address one of the questions that uh, have been coming in as we go through, uh, one of the questions that I saw was, do CSAs need to be trained and do they need to be certified? Um, so there's actually no requirement under the Clery Act that CSAs are trained. Although I would say that from my experience in working with the law, it would be very difficult to have CSAs understand what their role is um, and be able to navigate it well without some sort of training. Um, that said, regardless, they need to be informed of their role as campus security authorities. So we've also seen strategies, and sometimes this is a supplemental strategy in addition to training, is really looking at do we have, for example, emails that will go out on a regular basis or sporadically that remind people of their roles of CSAs, what does that mean? Do we have resources available? I've seen a number of different institutions develop something specific to their campus. Um, the Clery Act has, has um, pocket guides for campus security authorities, but I've also seen colleges and universities develop those specific to their campus that really provide some of the critical details they need to to know in terms of what's their role in terms of reporting, where does information go, and how does it get there. So I just want to take a little bit of time in looking at some of the questions coming in to explore some of the key takeaways from what we've just heard from Cheryl and Mo, and also to give some suggestions as to things that we've seen in our work. So the first piece is to understand that campus process for the intersection of the laws. And what we mean by that is taking a look at what are the requirements under Cleary, what are the requirements under Title IX, how are we communicating for two CSAs and responsible employees, and how do we make sure that that information is consistent. So, for example, we know that the Title IX coordinator is a campus security authority under the law. So all reports from responsible employees related to those um, crimes that relate to Title IX, so if we're talking about sexual violence, for example, all of those reports to a Title IX coordinator under Title IX would be shared for the purposes of Cleary. So the reason that we put understand the campus process is to make sure that when you're providing CSA training that you have a sense of where are reports coming into and how do we train on that process and provide specificity as to who is required to report. So as you're going through training, not only talking about that this is required, but also why. So when we're doing CSA training, one of the things that we really try to touch on and make sure is captured is that colleges and universities and the campus security authorities that must report at these locations have an understanding that the definition for CSAs is broader than campus police and security because there are a number of different people that are trusted on the campus. Um, so that student might choose to report to his or her coach because that's who he or she typically goes to with a problem. So helping CSAs understand this is why you're in this role and this is what we expect you to do as a part of this role is going to help better prepare them for if someone comes forward. You might be a role, for those of you who are listening, you might be in a role where somebody may report to you on a regular basis but a lot of CSAs on your campus are not. So the training and the time that you put into making sure there are materials available, um, the time that you spend doing the training will help them be better prepared for if that report occurs. Give practical tools to help the reporting process. So one of the strategies we see many institutions use is to have a CSA reporting form. Um, I believe there's a sample in the Handbook for Campus Safety and Security reporting, but still needs to be certainly updated to reflect some of the recent changes to the Clery Act. But it's giving CSAs a tool to help with that reporting. So when they have, for example, a document or a form um, whether that's on a website or whether that's something that they physically hand in, that form will help remind them of, of information that they should be sharing. So would the CSA know to share information such as the location that this crime took place? One of the questions that came in from one of our participants was asking whether or not a crime would be reported if it happened in the geography, but it didn't happen to one of the students. So it wasn't a member of the campus community, but it's still reported within Cleary geography. And the answer for that would be yes. We report those Cleary Act crimes that occur within Cleary geography that are reported to campus security authorities. So for, for information like that or for reports like that, having a reporting form can help that CSA remember what information has to be passed along 
and it makes sure that information gets to where it needs to go. It's possible that a CSA might fill out a reporting form and with the details that they put in that form, you recognize that it wasn't actually a crime that falls under the Clery Act. Even so, that would mean that the campus has the opportunity to um, analyze that and to make sure that the individuals making the report have the resources and have the information that they need. So having tools like reporting forms, having tools like handouts that um, help to clarify what the requirements are, are, are again helping CSAs be better poised in order to respond look to other institutions and expertise within the institution. So what that means is considering who on your campus might be um, best equipped to provide training, who on your campus might help you develop training resources. I know that um, Mo talked quite a bit about working with HR. So there might be people on your campus that have knowledge of certain systems or certain information. Um, I know within our organization, my colleague Amy is very good with tech, so that's somebody that I, I always look to for support and for information when I'm doing something working with technology. So similarly on your campus, you might consider who are the individuals on our campus that might have knowledge about how we might incorporate a training video into one of our systems, um, who might have knowledge as to how to build an effective reporting form. So it doesn't always necessarily need to be bringing somebody external into your campus, but really looking at how do we capitalize the resources that we have internally. And then also think about, and this is something that you're going to see within those draft or those sample slides that we included as a link for training CSAs, also think about training campus security authorities on how to respond if a crime is reported. So not only that they have this obligation to report if somebody discloses a crime to them, but also on how they can communicate that expectation to the person reporting. Um, one thing to consider or to think about is that when a report comes into a campus security authority, they're not only, it's not only for the purpose of including within annual statistics, but it's also for consideration as to whether a timely warning needs to go out, for example, if information needs to get added to the daily crime log. So you want to make sure that you're thinking about how a campus security authority can communicate um, that to someone reporting. So I'm, you know, thank you for sharing this information with me. I, you know, I appreciate that you trust me in that way. I want to let you know that I do need to share this information with and letting them know where the information is going to go. And also talking about what that means, that your the goal is still always to keep their information private and to make sure that they have the help and, and support that they need along the way. And then this last piece goes back to some of what Mo was talking about a little bit earlier, which is reporting requirements versus a reporting culture. So here we're talking a lot about what we're required to report and how to train those that are required, but we also know that our goal is to build a reporting culture. So and a space on the campus, a culture on the campus in which people come forward and choose to report because they are confident in the response that they're going to receive. And so a lot of that reporting culture starts with how CSAs respond, but then also goes more broadly into how do we communicate this information in other locations, such as our website, such as in handouts, such as in um, prevention programs on the campus. So just something to think about a little bit um, as we move forward into some of the requirements specific to local law enforcement. So for this last piece, and then we'll move into some of the, the questions that are coming in, for this last piece, we also know that institutions must request statistics from local law enforcement, and sometimes we hear institutions presenting this as a, a struggle um, in terms of what, their, what response they're receiving. So I want to pose a question that came in um, to the group because they were actually asking for some group feedback. So one of the things that one of our participants has asked is they said, in terms of gathering crime statistics, I reach out in advance. I still have only about a 60 to 70 percent response rate from local law enforcement. Um, so they were wondering, what is the response rate that others are seeing? So as we talk about, as Mo shares a little bit about his experience in working with local law enforcement, take some time in that chat function where you can put in information for questions. If you're willing to share some of your own experiences, please put that into there and then we can talk about that a little bit further as a group. So Mo, can you share a little bit with me, what are your methods that you use when reaching out to local law enforcement? Sure. Um, Drexel, we, we're unique than some campuses. We have our own police department. So um, we, we have a very good relationship with, with local law enforcement and specifically the Philadelphia Police Department, as well as other departments in the counties where 
the university has a presence. Um, specific to our Philadelphia campuses, uh, we have an MOU with the Philadelphia Police. And because we're a police agency as well, uh, part of this MOU grants us access to uh, criminal justice computer systems and data from the Philadelphia Police Department. So with that, they, give, they send us emails when certain crimes happen, and they give us access to their computer systems. And, and we're able to review their reporting systems and get copies of reports for crime that occur um, on our geography. However, we also still send out annual letters to all the police departments where we have a presence. Um, what we're learning is that uh, much of the crime data is now available online. Uh, several departments have responded and have directed us to a website for their statistics, for statistics. And there's usually a tool where you can put in uh, geography or, or a range, and it'll give you some data. Uh, last year, uh, our campus in Sacramento, California, the Sacramento Police Department, that was the response that they gave us. Uh, so we, we always ask for statistics annually. Um, and, um, and in our ASRs, we make sure we list the local police departments for each of our campuses. Uh, I put that down there because uh, our main public safety department is here in Philly, and everybody knows the number here in Philly, but for for reporting urgent crimes, we want them to contact the local police department. Um, last year, we sent out about 50 letters to local police departments around the country and worldwide uh, requesting statistics. Uh, I know there was a request for the, the success rate in getting stats back. Um, I would say all of the US letters, I have 100% success rate. My overseas letters are about 25 and 30%. Um, we receive responses from places like Poland, Greece, France, Iceland, um, and a few other countries. Uh, all the letters that we send go out through U.S. certified mail with return signature receipt requested. Um, and in a few cases, we used emails. Um, we have a couple locations that are remote. Uh, one such location is on, the, on an island off the coast of Nigeria. So we have an administrator out there who we send the email to, and he hand delivers the letters to the local police department. Um, I, I think it goes without saying that it's very important to maintain uh, relationships with local police. Uh, I know, at least from my own experience, that many of us working for public safety within higher education often come from local police departments. So I think it's really important to leverage those relationships where you can. Um, I think just remember that when requesting crime stats, um, it's, it's not just unique to your university. Everyone, every university um, is required to request statistics and is sending letters out to police departments. So if some department is refusing to provide data, especially local departments, you need to have a conversation with them and just say, hey, you know, we're required to have this and we need this from you and you need to come up with a, with a strategy on how to get that information from them. Um, some other strategy points that I, I kind of jotted down was, Earlier in the year is better to contact police departments. I've learned that many of them have their own year-end reports that they're working on. So um, you should be patient when waiting for a response. Um, I haven't had to wait longer than a couple of months for local police department responses. Um, by the second or third week of January, you need to get your letters out. I think, again, earlier is better. Um, and make sure you specify what you want. Uh, specify the geography, locations. Uh, things like that, if it's a specific building or address, make sure that's specific in your letter. And uh, you need to go beyond post-it notes. Uh, you need a strategy, and you need to create a timeline for getting this information out there. And you need to follow up. If you don't get a response, send a follow-up letter. And um, keep copies of everything. Uh, my approach is hard copy and electronic. So th those are the, the points that I have for getting stats from local law enforcement. Right, and I think you just did my quote of the day, which is going to be go beyond post-it notes, because I think it's a really good um, approach and it's a really good um, kind of nice way to summarize the fact that a lot of the challenges or the gaps that we see in terms of collecting statistics, whether it's from campus security authorities or from local law enforcement, is really are people taking the time or has the institution had the time to go beyond post-it notes into a formal structure for how they're documenting reports coming in, for having a system for sharing these reports in terms of some of the um, documents that we've talked about, um, reporting documents that we've talked about. And so I think going beyond post-it notes is a really good reminder for all of us of do we have a schedule and a structure for requesting this type of information. 
Um, so just to highlight some of what you shared, first I'm going to go back to some of the responses that we've received from a number of different institutions about their experiences with reaching out to law enforcement. We've had some people say 100% response rate. We've have had others say, I have, I have a really high response rate. I'm not always um, sure as to whether or not they're giving me accurate information um, or aligned with what I'm looking for. We've had others say, you know, our local law enforcement is very responsive to the point where they've gone, you know, those extra steps to make sure that they are matching the definitions with the most recent definitions within the Violence Against Women Act, amendments to the Cleary Act. Um, we've had others say 50% response rate. Um, and a lot of people have noted, and I know that you mentioned this a little bit as well, the study abroad or the um, abroad locations as well. So if the institutions owns or controls locations abroad and doing that type of outreach, um, you know, you mentioned Drexel has had really good um, some really good experiences with that. We have other campuses saying, you know, sometimes we get that those that information and sometimes we don't. So I want to kind of highlight some of what Mo said in terms of some of these challenges that participants are seeing and that we see on a regular basis. Um, this is also a good time to send in any additional questions. I know we've been answering some as we go along, but if there are more that we have not addressed, please feel free to send them in now. So one of the pieces that came up quite a bit is just building those relationships. So for many of you who are saying, you know, sometimes we get the information back, sometimes we don't. What we've heard from some local law enforcement is we had no idea as to how the campus was using this. We didn't understand the goals of why this was happening. And I think we've also seen some evolution over the years in terms of that involvement from local law enforcement. So recently, even at our trainings, we've had some campuses where not only will the institution attend a Cleary training, but we'll have local law enforcement, particularly for hosts, institutions, local law enforcement attending to better understand what campuses are required to do and the role that they might play in that. Now that is certainly the ideal. It is not always, as, as I'm sure many of you know, the experience that every institution has. But building that relationship and giving some context as to why you're asking for the things that you're asking for is really helpful. So you'll notice on this slide one of the things that it talks about is for your annual letters, making sure that you're being really specific in terms of here's what we need to know. So here's the requirement that's guiding us to ask for this information. Here are the specific crime definitions that we're looking for because we know that sometimes the Cleary definitions may differ from what local law enforcement is using. Specific locations, when you need the information by, and contact information. So think about when we're doing that request, have we done it in addition to verbally, are we also sending it by phone? Are we being really specific about what we need and why we need it? Um, and one of the things Mo also mentioned is that we can reach out for this at the beginning of the year. So we know that annual security reports have those um, statistics for the previous three years. So we can be starting in January doing this type of outreach. The other thing to consider and some institutions have in place are those memorandums of understanding. So if you have an MOU with local law enforcement, you can consider those pieces. Does it really outline that we are going to need these statistics and what we specifically need um, for our purposes of reporting? So those are just a couple of different suggestions. Again, it, may, it still may vary from campus to campus as to what it looks like in terms of bridging those relationships. Um, but one thing to consider is have we taken these particular steps in order, to, um, in order to bridge those gaps? And are there different ways that we can be communicating about these requirements that might see a better result? If you're still asking and you're not getting a response, it goes back to what we said earlier about documentation. So document when you sent the request, document what was in the request. So I sent this email on this day, I sent this letter on this date, I called this person on this date, I called again on this date. So noticing that you made that effort to get the statistics, um, and on that point, you know, at that point, once you've done all that you can do, the only local law enforcement can determine whether or not they're going to give it to you. And the campus can't be held responsible for if you did all of that outreach and you showed that effort to get the statistics and for whatever reason, local law enforcement is not giving it to you. But fortunately, we've seen in working with a lot of institutions that sometimes bridging that, those gaps in terms of information will lead to more feedback um, as to whether or not, uh, or will lead to more response, excuse me, from local law enforcement. 
Another piece are nurses and doctors. Are they campus security authorities? So the Handbook for Campus Safety and Security Reporting actually addresses things like advocates or nurses and doctors in the same section. And they said only if they provide significant responsibility for student and campus activities. So you want to think about are there other roles that these individuals are playing on the campus? Normally um, they, you know, there are laws that provide them with privilege and they would not be performing that function. However, you also want to think about um, the fact that for purposes of Cleary reporting, it's not tied to personally identifiable information. Um, so you might want to think about for things like pastoral and professional counselors? Do you have a voluntary confidential reporting procedure so that when a counselor is working with someone um, who may be sharing information about a crime that occurred on the campus, that there's a procedure for that counselor to provide information on how someone may report confidentially without providing um, identifying details so that the campus can make that analysis for the purpose of timely warning or that they can include those statistics within their annual security report. One thing to note is that that voluntary confidential reporting um, statement must be included within your annual security report. So whether you have that procedure or whether you don't, that's other information that you need to include within your policy statements. Um, and Mo, I was just wondering, so I know you talked a little bit more, um, and I, this is coming up in terms of the questions about study abroad and overseas. Is there any other information that you might share that might be helpful to some of the institutions that may have some of these locations? Yeah, sure. Just, this is just a learning experience for me. Um, I, I work with my study abroad office now, and what I try to have them do is that when they're setting up locations overseas to send their students is to talk to their host wherever they're going to stay or whatever hotel they're staying at or whatever institution they're going to and get the name and address of the local police department before they go so that at the end of the beginning of the year you're not scrambling to, to locate an address and um, going through foreign websites and trying to translate and trying to find a name and address for a local police department. I think just asking them to get that up front for you goes a long way in trying to get those letters out annually. So that was just the point I wanted to make. Yeah, I think definitely looking at what, what bridging or building those relationships look like. And another thing that's come up quite a bit and um, a number of different questions that are coming in is how do you look at all these different places where reports are being made and make sure that you're merging statistics without duplicating? So we know that that's a question that many of you have raised. It's one that we see over and over. So one thing to think about that may be um, something that can help create some solutions in that area is do you have a structure, so when you're looking at CSA reporting forms, when you're looking at if you have anonymous reporting, for example, do you have spaces on those reporting forms where people would identify if this information was reported anywhere else and when? or if this information has been shared with anyone else. So that's something to consider in terms of all of the different places where information may be living because that what that can help you do is better identify if one report has come into multiple different locations. Um, it looks like that is, um, we're almost out of time for today. We had the chance to address a number of different questions that were coming in um, in terms of, of who CSAs are and how to reach out to local law enforcement. So Cheryl, I just want to wrap up with you and if we take a look at some of the training that you've provided on your campus, what do you think when you're thinking about CSA training, what are some of the high level themes you want to make sure that CSAs walk away with when you're conducting this training on the campus? So when you, I know you've mentioned a lot of in-person training, what are some of the, the kind of high level goals of training that you think have been so critical to the CSAs on your campus? Okay, um, I, I think that um, for, for our particular situation, it's about uh, making sure that they understand, that all people understand the spirit of the law and that essentially what we're trying to do is prevent any other uh, crime from taking place and so they have to understand what their role is. For me, because we're small, it's often easy for our staff and faculty to get in the weeds and by that I mean really want to help the person who's reporting the incident, you know, just try to take them all the way through it and they need to understand that their role is really 
to take the information and to pass it on to the appropriate person, not try to stay in an investigative role um, and walk with the person through uh, the scenario. So we really stress that we want to uh, really impress upon them our core values of, of respect for the dignity of others and, and uh, responsibility, but we want them to understand that there are people designated to handle the situation, so we want them to take the information and get it in the right hands. That's really the high level piece that we want our people to know. Right, and I think that's such a great takeaway. So when you're thinking about communicating these responsibilities to CSAs, especially in the form of training, is there a way to talk about how they don't need to know all of the ins and outs of the law? There are a number of different people that are working with Cleary on your campus, but what they do need to know is that once they receive this information, they need to know where it goes and how to get it there. Um, and one of the things that she talked about is, or, and some of the things that may be um, useful in terms of training too, is to think about if you have opportunities for them to actually practice what this might look like. So having case studies or having role plays in terms of the different types of training that you offer and really driving home what I'm seeing come into our chat box over and over um, even when you talked about how you train on your campus so many of you said you know we talk about starting with Jean Cleary's story um, and why this law exists or we start by talking about why this is important to our campus and how we make sure that we're providing support to victims or survivors. So connecting it to the why is going to be critical and some of the you know as we mentioned and we provided that link to to sample slides that you can use for campus security authority training. There's also some language within those slides that can guide you in terms of what are some of the conversations or talking points that can happen at each point. Um, on the slide in front of you is our contact information. So as you're going through, I know we throw a lot of different resources um, for not just Cleary compliance, but for campus security authorities in particular. So feel free to reach out to us, connect with those resources, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you again to Cheryl and Mo and to all of you for joining us today. Uh, we apologize again for some of the technical difficulties we were having in the beginning of the webinar, but hopefully all of you had a chance to download the handouts um, and a chance to see some of those slides that unfortunately weren't working for us in the beginning. In the chat panel, you're going to see a link to an evaluation for today's webinar. So we would certainly appreciate if you can take a few short minutes just to share your thoughts and your feedback. It informs all of the different um, programming and resources that we, avail we make available throughout the year, and we'd love to know what kind of content you'd like to see more of. As a reminder, this webinar is just one of several webinars for National Campus Safety Awareness Month. We have another one on campus security authorities and responsible employees next week, so if you didn't get a chance to register but that's an area um, that's especially interesting to you, please join us for that. And this webinar recording will be included in next week's National Campus Safety Awareness Month email blast and on the Cleary Center YouTube page. So you can click on the links in the chat panel to register for upcoming webinars, and you can also sign up to receive those weekly professional development emails so that you have the recording. You can listen to it again if there were things that you wanted to capture, and reach out to us if you have any additional questions. We also encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Twitter using the Cleary Center handle for daily campus safety information um, and tweets. And as Amy has been plugging into the control panel, we're also using the, has the hashtag NextSAM2015. So thank you to the folks that have been sharing about what their campus is doing. Um, Mo and Cheryl both also referenced our Cleary Center collaborative program, so you can visit our website to learn more about other training opportunities and the collaborative program, which is our team-based learning membership program that really brings together colleges and universities to build sustainable approaches around campus safety and Cleary Act compliance. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us using the email, um, the email on the screen, info at clearycenter.org. We're happy to follow up on any questions that you might have after the webinar. And thank you for all, to all of you for joining us, and have a great afternoon.